All right, so now we're going to look at just a few of the properties that a cross product has. So the cross product, it is order dependent. A cross B is not the same as B cross A. And this is because A cross B points in the direction given by the right hand rule. So if I reverse the order in the vectors that I'm taking the cross product of, then they just the, the cross product then points in the opposite direction. So we have that A cross B is equal to negative B cross A. If I scalar multiply one of the vectors, I could scalar multiply A by C, or scalar multiply the cross product by C, or scalar multiply the other vector by C. It doesn't matter where I put the scalar in terms of computing the cross product. There is a distributive property. A will distribute across a sum in terms of the cross product. And we also have listed here the distributive property from the right as well. So the cross product distributes across a sum. And the final two properties, the second last one talks about how the dot product can be mixed together with the cross product. So when I take a cross product B cross C, that produces another vector. And that vector I can dot with A. That produces a scalar. This is known as the scalar triple product. So this is a scalar triple product. It's a product of three vectors, which is why we have the word triple product there. And the result is a scalar because the last operation is a dot product, which produces a scalar. Now, having said that, what do you think this triple product would be called? Again, it's a product of three vectors what kind of result comes out of it? Is it a scalar or is it a vector? Well, it's a cross product followed by another cross product that produces a vector. So this is known as a vector triple product. And so A cross B cross C is equal to, and there's, it's showing here that it's a linear combination of B and C and the weights or the coefficients in front of the B and C are given by scalars which come from the dot products of the various original vectors. Now this scalar triple product, the, the second one from the bottom of the list, that has a geometric interpretation. The geometric interpretation of that is it actually gives a volume or the magnitude of it gives a volume. So if I have those three vectors a, b, and c, and I'm imagining they're situated something like this in space, then they form what's known as a parallelopiped. So it's a parallelopiped, this three-dimensional object, kind of like a rectangular box, but skewed a little bit. What is the volume of this? Well, we compute the volume just like we would any other cylinder, is we take the area of a cross-section and multiply it by its height. What is the area of a cross-section? Well, in this case, it's the area of the base. So we've got our volume is going to be the area of the base, which is the magnitude of A cross B, that's the area of the parallelogram, times the height. What is our height in this case? Our height is this value here. So our height is C, oh, we'll put vector symbols on those, C times the magnitude of cos theta, where theta is the angle between C and A cross B. You may say, why do I have absolute values around cos theta? Well, the idea is I really don't know if C points in the same direction as A cross B or if C points in the opposite direction. For example, if I switch the order of A and B in the diagram, then their cross product would point down. And so I'm just eliminating that by slapping absolute value signs on cosine of theta to get the height. The height should be a positive value. And so now we can pull the absolute value signs out around the whole expression. So I'm taking these absolute value signs around the cosine theta and I'm just bringing them around the whole expression. So that's A cross B in magnitude times the magnitude of C times cosine of the angle between them. But this expression here, that's just the dot product of those two vectors. It's the dot product of C and A cross B. So this becomes the magnitude of the dot product 
of C and A cross B. And so that's telling me that the scalar triple product, so A cross B and then dotted with C, the magnitude of that has a geometric interpretation. It's the volume of the parallelopiped. Let's go ahead and use that. So we're going to use the scalar triple product to determine if these four points lie in the same plane. So let's get a sketch of these points. So I've got four of them. I'm going to choose one of them as sort of my base point that I'm going to draw vectors coming out of. P seems to have the nicest representation in terms of it's just 1, 0, 1. So then if I do Q, R, and S and construct these vectors that start at P and go out to these three points, then it's a little bit easier to figure out what these are. So what these vectors P to Q, P to R, and P to S are. Because if I go tip minus tail, I just take Q, R, and S and subtract one from the X component and the Z component, because P is just one, zero, one. So subtracting one from the X component and one from the Z component, I get one, four, five. Subtracting one from the X component and one from the Z component, I get neg uh, two, negative one, one. And one from the X component and one from the Z component, I get 5, 2, 7. Now what I want to do with these is I want to determine if these three vectors live in the same plane. Well, I make the connection with the parallelopiped. If I scroll back up to the picture, imagine C didn't actually point up, but C was in the same plane as A and B. If that was the case, then the parallelopiped they would create would just be a flat plane. In other words, it would have zero volume. Because C points up and out of the plane made by A and B, then it creates a solid of positive volume. So the scalar triple product is non-zero. So knowing whether the scalar triple product is zero or not really tells me something about how these three vectors are related to each other. So let's go ahead and compute their scalar triple product. We are going to compute the triple product of P, Q, P, R, and P, S. And that triple product is going to be the dot product of one with the cross product of the other two. Maybe I'll write it out. I was going to, well, I'll, I'll write it out in this way first because this is really the heart of the matter. I really want to compute the determinant of the, this matrix because that is the triple product. I'll move it over and we'll see why that's the case here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take PQ, dot it with PR cross PS. And if we do that, it's really just the determinant of this matrix. And we can go ahead and compute the determinant. So it's going to be one times the determinant of this submatrix, which is uh, negative 7 minus 2, or negative 9. And then we've got minus 4 times the determinant of this submatrix. So 2 times 7 is 14 minus 5. 14 minus 5 is 9. And then we get plus 5 times the determinant of this submatrix. Sub 2 times 2 is 4, plus 5 is 9. Oh, a lot of 9's here. Well, that's nice because I can then just factor out the 9. And I get a negative 1, minus 4, plus 5. Oh, I get negative 5 plus 5 is 0, so this boils down to 0. What that means is that the volume of the parallelopiped is 0. So volume is 0. And so that means that the vectors lie in the same plane. And so this means that the points all lie in the same plane. So yep, the points all live in the same plane. And we figured that out without actually having to construct a plane. What we did was we found the volume of the parallelopiped that those points would make and that 
parallel pipe it had zero volume and so the points had to all live in the same plane. All right let's look at one more example this is our last example of the section of where a cross product can show its usefulness. Uh, here we're going to let P be a point that's not on a line and that line passes through points Q and R. What we're going to do is we're going to show that the distance from the point P to the line is given by this uh, magnitude of a cross product and there's some normalization happening there. So let's get a picture for this. We've got a line. We've got a line that contains points Q and R. And we have a point that's not on the line. That'll be point P. And I'm interested in figuring out how far away this point P is from the line. The main thing we need to realize is that the shortest distance from this point P to the line is going to be along this line segment that makes a right angle with the line L. And so you might think, well, why, why is that? Maybe it seems so intuitive that it's like, oh, oh, oh yeah, that's obvious. Or you might say, yeah, okay, it does seem obvious, but why is that true? <laughs> um, it's a good question. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to do this. I'm just going to draw an arbitrary line that doesn't make a right angle. And that makes a triangle now. And now that we have this triangle, we know that for a triangle, there's our right angle. Of the three sides of the triangle, the hypotenuse is the longest side. So that means this side is going to be longer than this side. And that's true for all triangles that I write out here, that this side is always going to be the longest one. So in other words, what it means is that orange line segment that I dotted in there is the shortest distance to the line L. Okay, so now we've got that line segment that we're interested in. That's the thing I want to find the length of. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to say I've got a point Q on the line. I've got a point P that I'm interested in, figuring out the distance from that point P to the line. So I'm going to introduce this vector. And this vector Q to P, that's given the name B in the question. So that's right here. Uh, we also had the vector Q to R is also given a name. Maybe I'll draw that one in too. So Q to R, that had the name of A. And so what are we interested in? We're interested in the length of the orange line segment. So because of that right triangle, this is the length of B times sine of the angle theta. That's just using uh, properties of right triangles, the length of their sides, and the relationship with the angles inside them. So now we've got our diagram set up. We can go ahead and compute what we want. We want that length D. The length D is precisely the length of that orange line segment. So that's the length of B sine theta. What is sine theta? Well, sine theta is the sine of the angle between A and B. We already know that sine of theta is related to the cross product of the vectors A and B and their magnitudes. So this is the magnitude of A cross B all over A, uh, the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B. And now I can cancel off the magnitude of B top and bottom and I get that the distance D is equal to the length of the cross product of A and B divided by the length of A. And again, like we had with earlier results, uh, projection in terms of the dot product. It looks like it depends on the magnitude of A. The magnitude of A is just the direction vector the line L points in. So this really has nothing to do with how long A is because I could rewrite it as this. I'll just bring that magnitude of A underneath the A. And so this is a unit vector in the direction of L. So in the direction of the line L. And so this says that what is the distance from P to the line? It is, all I need to do is find for any point on the line L, just figure out what the vector is from that point on the line out to P, and then I just cross it with 
the unit vector in the direction of the line L and take its magnitude and that gives me my distance. And so that's a very nice relationship now between distance of points to lines and the cross product. All right, so that's it for the last example and that's it for this section. So thanks very much for watching and we'll see you again next time.